Hello and welcome to another edition of Questions for Lawyers. Today, we have an old friend visiting us from afar, from parts unknown, my good friend, Matthew Konecki, who is a two-time member of the Questions for Lawyers Club. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Jeff, good to see you as always, especially, uh, you know, I'm glad we can do it from afar. Absolutely. Well, um, this is kind of a very strange time for all of us in our lives and in our law practices. And I thought today would be a good day for us to kind of talk about the differences that you've seen in your practice, whether it be on the civil side or on the criminal defense side, which uh, you do uh, criminal defense, which I'm not involved in. And I thought that the audience would be very curious about how things have changed over at the courthouse for criminal defendants. Well, it's, it's like everything else, it's changed uh, dramatically. And, um, you know, when we first got the order uh, that basically either the courts were closing, you know, that just sends everybody into upheaval. Uh, especially criminal defendants. Um, and then I know there was a, a, a great concern with those who were in jail at the time. And essentially, so when we, we first looked at when the order was placed by the Supreme Court of Florida, they suspended uh, a defendant's uh, right to a speedy trial. And that's crazy if you think about it. That's rarely happened. It's, it's happened a few times. You know, there may have been a few times during we, we've had hurricanes um, but those are temporarily, you know, you know, you know, in, in a week, a, a week or two, a month, you're going to get power back and things are going to go back to normal. And here we are, you know, right now, the Supreme Court has extended this to June 1st. And, you know, by all accounts, I, I don't see us getting ready to try a jury trial, at, at, you know, June 1st. So it's going to extend even further. So that means, you know, you have a constitutional right that is now uh, no longer a right anymore. You know, a de defendant, one, could be sitting in jail, ready to go to trial, or two, even, you know, someone who's not in jail, um, you know, is, is ready to have their case heard. Maybe they need to get a case resolved um, by a jury trial in order to go on with their job. Maybe their job has suspended them while, you know, the case is pending. So that's like the biggest thing that I, I, I think that shocks me. And I mean, I don't pretend that I have an answer to this right now. And I know, Jeff, you, you with the civil courts are exploring, hey, could we do a, a virtual trial? Right. Jury trial? Um, and, I, you know, again, this situation has forced us to think about these things that we never had to think about before. So I, I'm not pretending I have the answers right now to, to how we, you know, make sure a defendant has their um, civil rights um, and, and criminal rights uh, enforced, but I, I just know that this is an unprecedented time. So that that's, that was the first major thing. And then, you know, initially the, the courts with that first order, the courts kind of went down for all non-essential hearings. Now, I would actually, that first week was able to go because I had a couple hearings um, that were considered essential. Um, and, you know, so, so what, first was considered essential hearings were first appearance. So if someone got arrested, um, you have a right to see a judge within 24 hours and sometimes it could be extended to 48 hours. So that's why there's you know court on the weekends for people who get arrested. So those are still in place. Um, there's been a couple procedure modifications to that. Now attorneys can appear by phone so they don't have to, but you know you could still go there in, in person as an essential hearing. Um, so, you know, those uh, arraignments, which are the actual first court date, that's where the state announces formal charges being filed. Uh, those uh, were considered essential hearings. Um, and, and if uh, usually if a defendant didn't show for one within that first month, you know, the judge is going to plead them not guilty on their behalf and then set the case down, out down the, the line. So there really wasn't kind of any a need for anybody initially to, to go to court. Uh, but now they're allowing certain hearings to proceed forward, um, you know, as, uh, you know, essential, and now even non-essential hearings are being uh, allowed, but most of them are through um, Zoom, and we're, I've got a couple, my first couple ones set next week, 
but um, even non-essential hearings, uh, you know, you can, well, I, 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 let me take that back. Non-essential hearings, you're not gonna go to the courthouse for. Non-essential hearings are gonna be heard. Now, initially they weren't gonna be heard in the misdemeanor division, only in the um, felony division, but now non-essential hearings could be heard um, in that regard. Uh, but if you had a, an essential hearing, you could actually go to the courthouse, whereas, you know, people in the civil end may not be able to have that kind of recourse. But one of the things that I found was when, when this initially happened, I looked at what were some of the, you know, hot things that I had going on that needed to be addressed, and I reached out to the prosecutor. We were able to get a lot of agreed orders right away because um, they understood that the situations, things that weren't big ticket issues, but still needed to be addressed, we were able to address right away. Yeah, well, I mean, we all heard the stories about people being released from jail, which, again, how serious do, is it if they're actually making those kind of a d decisions? Uh, that's when it really uh, had to be apparent to everybody. We were not living in normal times when they're actually letting out nonviolent uh, criminals. And with that being said, with not having a speedy trial, um, what are you telling your clients right now about that? Well, exactly what we're discussing here is, you know, one, it's an unprecedented time, um, you know, two, just to be patient. Um, and I listen, um, there are people that need to have their cases heard as soon as possible. And then there's those that wouldn't mind if the case extended for two or three years, you know, because uh, that may be a better situation for them. So, you know, I have understanding clients, everybody understands uh, what's going on, I, you know, at least on with my, with my clients. Um, and, you know, but we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this in a month, you know, when someone says, hey, listen, I, I need to get this through, you know, what, what can we do? I, I will tell you one of the things that we've now are starting to do is um, we've had cases that are ready to um, be pled out and judges are taking pleas and um, and then they're all also allowing what are called pleas in abstentia for, for misdemeanor cases where, you know, someone's not going to have to go to jail. Um, the judge can take all the, the signed paperwork. Um, you know, we kind of do it virtually. And, uh, you know, they get the paperwork ahead of time, make sure it's filled out correctly. And then we have a hearing on it and someone can enter their plea and be adjudicated, you know, with their case on that day without actually physically being present because they've, you know, sworn to everything being true and correct and they understand their rights. Um, and that's actually a process that's been going on for years. You know, out of state defendants, you know, a lot of times don't have to fly back in um, to have their case heard if it's not a serious offense and it's not including jail time, something to that effect, it's, it's been going on for years. Now we're just taking it a step further where in-county defendants might be able to get afforded the same uh, kind of service, as I should say, with this um, plea in abstention. Let me ask you this, with regards to uh, the clients that you're going with hearings or things you've been hearing around the courthouse, are defendants able to make first appearances by Zoom right now? Uh, first appearances, no. So it, first appearances are, are actually done at the jail. So there's going to be um, people who are arrested. They're, they're going to be present for that, or they, they can physically waive their appearance, and the judge is going to just rule the public defender is going to be there or private counsel and the state as well. I, I have not actually been able to be at a uh, first appearance um, however, I, you know, was, I got consulted on, a, uh, on one right before the, the defendant was to be, you know, like literally minutes before they were supposed to be in court, and they just proceeded forward, and then the defendant got out because they were issued a bond, um, and, you know, so they've, they're now allowing, like I said, the uh, attorneys to appear by phone for, for that type of hearing. But, you know, when anybody's arrested, even if they don't qualify for the public defender, they're going to be appointed a public defender for first appearance. Sure. Well, that's just something that uh, on some of the webinars I've listened to, some judges have actually brought up the possibility of doing that. Well, uh, and, and the, the idea of a, of a Zoom, Zoom hearing 
um, for a first appearance. It, it really should be, you know, right now, I'll just use, well, it, both in Broward and uh, Palm Beach, there's a lot of satellite jails. And um, so instead of busing everybody over to one particular jail, for instance, in, in Palm Beach and Belle Glade, they have a jail facility there. They don't, for first appearance, they don't bus them in. They have closed circuit TV. So there is no, there is no reason that that couldn't be done. There, I don't really want to get started on, you know, they should have the ability for lawyers to meet with um, defendants in the jail. They, they've set it up in Broward County. They were doing that for years with the public defender's office, but they weren't allowing private attorneys to do that. Um, they, they have the capabilities. And, and again, maybe this will force the judicial system and the sheriff's office in both counties to say, hey, listen, there's got to be a better way. And I can tell you as a practicing criminal defense attorney, there is nothing worse than blowing a half day waiting to visit one client at the jail because you got to wait for a room. You got to wait to make sure they're not on shift change. You got to, you know, even if you've got to ask the client, you know, just two or three questions, you could blow two or three hours just for that. There's nothing more frustrating. However, like what we're seeing now, if you could have a scheduled Zoom call or whatever, you know, whatever program they want to use, you could literally go through, you know, meet efficiently with the client, have everything explained. I could show documents. I could say, you know, hey, this is the evidence. What do you think about this? You know, we could go through that and, and really have a meaningful um, conversation where I'm not waiting till I've got two or three defendants that I need to see at the jail. Um, we could just, you know, regularly schedule them. I, I think it would be a lot better for both. It would, it would speed up the process for criminal justice time for the time a defendant, you know, is in jail because, you know, a lot of times we're waiting to see them when we get evidence, that kind of stuff. It would speed up the process so much more. You know, we've brought up a term several times during this conversation, Matt, and for those who may be listening or watching, we kind of take it for granted when we say speedy trial. What exactly does speedy trial mean? Sure. Uh, and great point, Jeff. Um, you know, I, and I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, um, I had a conversation with a client today. I don't expect it you know, my clients to understand all of these terms when I first meet them, that why would, you know, if you've never been in trouble with the law, why would you understand these things? Um, I actually wrote a book, as you know, my loved one's been arrested, what's next? I actually just, um, uh, I have my second edition of this. We just- uh, I can't wait to get my autographed copy. You, you'll, it's in the mail. Okay. Uh, but, it, and it's, it's available uh, on my website for download. But, um, in there, I, I explain some of these processes, but I, I do want to explain what speedy trial is. So, so when someone's arrested, you have a constitutional right. Now, this is by the Florida Constitution. You have a right to be uh, tried within a certain period of time. Now, for a misdemeanor, it's 90 days, and um, for a felony, it's 175. Now, when basically, those aren't the exact dates, because what happens is, is once speedy trial has expired, you got to file a notice, then it's a few more days before you get a hearing. And then once the judge has that hearing, it's 10, 10 more days. So it, but it, it gives you a, a time period. So as long as, as a defendant, you don't waive speedy trial, the state has to put up or shut up. That means they have to bring their witnesses. They have to be prepared to go to court. And if they're not, the judge will dismiss the case. And um, unless there's some good cause. And again, right now, this COVID situation would be a good cause. But, you know, outside of this realm, unless there's a, a specific good cause, uh, you know, the defendant could have the right to have their case dismissed and jeopardy would attach, meaning that the state couldn't just, uh, you know, just refile, it, you know, dismiss it and then refile it again. So, um, you know, the idea that the Supreme Court of Florida is saying, hey, we're taking away this constitutional right because of this unique situation, I think it's huge. I've never even heard of anything like that. And I can't imagine there's too many times in history where if it has been waived, that it's been waived for this long of a period of time. Right. And I'm using the wrong word, not waived, but uh, what do you call it, told? 
told. Yes, that they say it's just it's basic like hitting the pause button on your DVR. It's ever just it's just stopped, and as soon as we get through and we can do it again, they'll unpause it. So. And what's interesting is if it continues, and again we talk about virtual trials, Zoom trials, and all that. For those defendants who may be in jail, if that's the only alternative is to have a trial in that fashion, kind of puts them in a very odd predicament. It absolutely does. And I wouldn't be surprised, depending on how long this goes on, that there are not some sort of um, civil rights recourses, 1983 actions being held mm -hmm. saying, hey, you, you, I have a right to a jury trial. I can't get it tried. Um, and, you know, I'm sitting in jail. I'm innocent until proven guilty. And, um, but what I think is happening right now, and especially, and you mentioned it before, a lot of the jails are have kind of opened up is that um, they're, you know, taking into consideration this. So, you know, obviously violent felony offenders aren't going to get released. However, you know, drug charges, um, you know, monetary charge, you know, like a grand theft, something like that. Um, you know, I, I, the courts are going to, you know, with an abundance of caution, you know, release someone like that more likely. In fact, you know, I've, I've been contacted quite a bit lately um, since this for people who have warrants and they've had them for a very long time, um, whether they've known about it or not, you know, it's, different story but they you know they're coming to realize i've got a warrant out there oh oh my gosh if i get picked up now i can't just bond out or i can't just have a, a quick trial uh i could be literally held for a very long period of time so you know with some of those cases we've been able to actually resolve so that they don't go to jail so that they, they're back on what's called pre-trial release and then um you know and then they'll get their day uh, in court once this kind of clears up I mean, it's so much more now than just going to jail, getting picked up. I mean, the reason they're being released is because of the cases they've had in the jails of COVID-19. So uh, I can imagine that you have had clients calling you concerned about their outstanding warrants. I mean, what a terrible time to get picked up. It's not a good time, but I mean, it could be uh, deadly. Yes. Well, and you know, one of the things that we've seen is, a, is an actual decrease in crime because everybody is at home. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit because South Florida is, as always, kind of different than the rest of the state. Uh, Governor DeSantis is doing a slow reopen for the middle and the northern part of the state, but he says South Florida is not ready yet. So we still have a lot of stay at home orders uh, and what happens if you violate that, Matt? Well, so it, the violation of the Health and Safety Act, it's, it's a second degree misdemeanor, which it, it's a low level misdemeanor. It's the lowest you can go. It's punishable up to 60 days in jail and, and a, a $500 fine. Um, it is, you know, and I've seen that because I'm just kind of keeping an eye on the booking blotter and what's going on. The people are being arrested right now, if, you know, there are, those are additional charges that I've never seen in my entire, you know, career practicing. And now we're seeing a whole bunch of new uh, uh, crimes that, uh, you know, didn't exist really before. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's an additional uh, crime, but, you know, there was a situation where there was a bunch of teens going around um, breaking into cars and basically taking advantage of the fact that people were all home. And uh, the state attorney in Palm Beach County, Dave Ehrenberg, said that he was going to look into possibly, you know, because it was a violation of the order, make it an enhancement to any kind of burglary charge that was um, available. And I, you know, I'm not exactly sure how he would go about doing that if it's codified in the actual statute that it could be used as an enhancement. But the idea is, is that they're going to bring the hammer down more because you took advantage of a situation um, where, you know, everybody is forced to be home and, you know, in, in their company. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, uh, with the different changes that are coming down from the Florida Supreme Court in response to this pandemic, for people to be out and about and violating that, it's pretty flagrant and 
horrible. So you would think that uh, the state attorney would go out of go out of their way to uh, punish the wrongdoers. Well, yeah, and especially it, when it, when you're talking about going out in a planned type of event, you know, one of the other upticks in crime, you know, overall crime is down, but you know, in the domestic uh, violence uh, realm, you know, we're seeing an uptick in, in those as well. And, you know, people are, you know, we're all under a huge amount of stress as it is um, with this going on, you know, everybody's trying to work from home. Some people have, they're, you know, they don't have a job anymore because of this. And so there's, there's a tremendous amount of stress. And then, you know, you, you bottle it up and then you say you're forcing people to be at home you know, it, it, it's a, it can be a ticking time bomb. So we're seeing more domestic violences out there. And, you know, and those are cases where, you know, on a domestic violence case, you don't get a notice to appear and avoid arrest. No, that's something that you have, you know, you have to be arrested, see, see the uh, first appearance judge so they can issue a temporary stay away order. And then now that person can't go back to the home that they were ordered to stay at. So there's a whole bunch of new problems that, that arise with those types of cases, but you know, those are an uptick. And, and believe it or not, Jeff, there's still people getting out, out and getting DUIs right now. And, and whether or not that's because somebody's at home uh, getting bored, drinking, and then saying, ah, I just, gotta, I just gotta get out of here. I don't know if you saw that uh, about a month ago, the UFC fighter, John Jones, uh, was arrested for DUI. Um, yes. And he, he saw, he just said to the officer, I, I just had, you know, I, I was bored. I went for a joyride and well, didn't. Figured didn't nobody's on the roads. Yeah. <laughs> Figured he got his uh, discount from uh, his insurance company. He's like, oh, well, you know, nobody's out there anyway. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what you did with your $30. Um. I think I ordered a movie or something, maybe, you know, maybe bought some extra popcorn. I don't know. It, not, not much, not much. Um, I may have used it for uh, ordering WWE pay-per-views. So how about WrestleMania in front of no audience this year, Matt? Uh, yeah, I, 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 um, I'm going to reserve comment on it. You know how much I love wrestling and uh, you know, I, uh, I, I was happy that I had something new to watch, but it really wasn't the same thing, was it? No. No, it was uh, definitely a, a little bit of a distraction, but uh, wrestling is sort of like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, without an audience, I don't think it's worth watching. <laughs> you know, the chance, the different... Good call. It, yeah, I mean... People ask me about that. I'm like, yeah, it's it's kind of like that. And if you've ever been to the Rocky Horror Picture Show live with, you know, people acting it out, um, that's the best. The movie's terrible, but the people make it make the experience. So, are you kind of saying it's like a mime without an audience? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you. You you brought in uh, your book. Can you just briefly? tell uh, everybody what's in there, uh, sure. how they can get it, uh, just, uh, you know, the title. And, you know, I know you're very proud of that and I've read through it. It's fantastic. Thanks. The first edition. I need to read edition. the second edition. I'm very excited about it. So it, it, the book is called My Loved One's Been Arrested, What's Next? And, and basically it's the guide for, you know, the mother who gets a call that their son was just arrested um, or, the husband and wife, or the friend. Um, and so basically, it kind of spells out what that person should do. And the first thing is not to freak out. You know, I, obviously, this is, you know, your loved one committed a mass murder, it's time to freak out. But, it, you know, it, we're, we're talking about this, you know, Jeff, my, my practice consists of regular people that made a mistake. You know, um, and there's varying degrees of that. You know, there's some career criminals, but there's, you know, a lot of my clients are first time offenders and they don't have any kind of uh, history with the law and they're, they never will again. So this, I, this book kind of gives you and gives the family an idea of what they can do, how to, you know, calm themselves down, um, understanding this roadmap. You know, we take for granted that 
we've been practicing law 18 years now. We've done these types of cases. We're pretty familiar. We know what we can anticipate what can happen. But for someone who has only watched, you know, court TV shows that aren't realistic, they have a different expectation. This book kind of gives you an expectation of what to expect. It defines, you know, kind of what we talked about before, what people's speedy trial rights are, you know. Um, but it also gives you, you know, like if, if you, you know, had someone arrested, how to go about finding a bondsman, um, how to go about finding uh, an attorney, because, you know, other people, uh, you know, from across the country have, have ordered this book. And while, you know, it really pertains to Florida, it gives you things to ask, you know, one of the, one of the questions I think is what people think to ask a lawyer when, the, uh, when they're interviewing is, what's your win-loss record? Well, when you're doing criminal defense, you know, you already have the cards stacked against you. And what is a win for some person might be a loss for another, or what might be considered a loss for one person could be a huge win. And I give you the example, I had a, I had a uh, client charged with, you know, four felony counts of varying domestic uh, assault type situations. We went to trial and he was found not guilty on three and he got a, a misdemeanor charge of battery. Well, that was a huge win. Uh, but if you wanted to look, I lost that count. So that, that could be considered a loss. It's not, the wins and losses really don't matter. It's, you know, look at um, you, things to think about are um, simple things like look at client reviews. You know, if, if look at what those client, previous clients are saying about the lawyer. Are they honest? Are they trustworthy? Do they return the phone calls? Because you can hire the best lawyer in the world, but if he doesn't return your phone call, you know, what good is that to you? You're going to walk around on eggshells until your, your, your day in court. So kind of gives you that, that kind of process, an expectation of how long a court case is going to take. Um, and then, um, you know, what could be alternatives to going to trial? So that was kind of the, the, the object of the first you know, the first edition of the book. The second edition, you know, I started thinking about it, you know, I have a lot of defendants, uh, you know, requesting this book. So then I put in, well, what if it's you, you know, what to do, which it just kind of varies the first part of the book. And then we talk about um, the, what happens after trial, if you get placed on probation, um, or, you know, if you take a plea and you go on probation. And then the last thing, that I'm finding most people are interested in is how do you get your record clean if you are successful? So we talk oh, about expungement. the expungement. Yeah, yeah, expungement process. And now even getting your mugshot removed because you can have an expungement and your mugshot can be plastered still all over the internet. And because they're private companies, they're not really required to take them down, you know, unless there's a few circumstances. And I explain that in the book. So thank you for letting me get my cool. plug in. Such a cruel thing to do to somebody for getting arrested to have that out there by these private companies. I, I've just always felt very uh, uneasy about that. Absolutely. So, but so, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Well, listen, I, I had you, I know what kind of work that you, you do. I've referred um, many, many people to you over the years. And like you said, if people go and look at your client reviews, they would see why, because you do return calls, you give practical advice, and uh, you really, your results speak for themselves. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you, Matt, can you tell them how to do that? Yeah, the, the simple way is go, you can go onto my uh, website, which is 561law.com. It'll bring you to the bigger domain name, which is matthewconnickypa.com. Um, but there's a lot of resources. There's videos. Uh, not only is there this book, there's a couple other uh, informational guides available for download there. Um, you know, our, our number is 561-671-5995. You can give us a call. Um, we have a satellite office in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, you know, I, I really will handle, you know, under the right circumstances, everything from uh, Dade County up to uh, St. Lucie County. But, um, you know, try to keep it in the Broward and uh, Palm Beach County area. So if you're going to commit a crime, you prefer those two counties. Yes. 
<laughs> I'm bite my tongue. Sorry, I had to. What would you say? I'm sorry. I'm gonna bite my tongue right now. Yeah. I had to give you a little little teasing. Well, again, I can't think of anybody better to have on the show on this very, very festive Rusev day. I appreciate <laughs> you being on with me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And uh, I think that anybody who's watching this or listening, uh, you gave a lot of really valuable information uh, during this uh, unusual time, but practical information really for any time now. Well, I appreciate that, Jeff, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing with the ABOTA. Um, you know, you're keeping us lawyers informed about what's, what's, what the courts are doing and how to make best use of uh, the resources out there to keep these cases moving. And I, I, you know, like, my, like my clients that want a resolve to their case, your clients want that same kind of resolve. And it, right now we're in this area uh, of, of time where, you know, it, it, it certainly, it's hard to move a case, but it can be done as you're finding too. Oh, I, I appreciate that, Matt. Well, if you ever want to get in touch with me, again, my name is Jeff Edelman. The number is 954-341-2777. We're going to continue uh, this great uh, interview show where uh, I'm going to continue bringing you uh, top attorneys in the area to talk about how you can have the best legal knowledge possible. And uh, they will answer the questions that you may be initially afraid to ask or might not know that you need to ask. So again, Matt Conaghy, thank you so much for your time. Talk Thanks, to you Jeff. soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.